today we have our uh, lecture number 38 in which we continue our discussion of chapter 29 which is about the calculation of the magnetic fields produced by electric currents this is the material that we discussed in the last section we introduced uh, bios abat law which enables us to calculate the magnetic fields produced by electric currents we used it in two applications the first one to find the magnetic field due to an infinitely long straight wire and we saw that it's given by this equation and it is inversely proportional to the distance from the wire the second application was to find the magnetic field at the center of a circular arc and we saw that it is given by this equation in here today we have two topics. The first one is the magnetic force between two wires and the second topic we have today is Ampere's law. So let's start with the first one. Let's say that we have uh, two uh, parallel wires carrying currents. Two long parallel wires carrying currents exert forces on each other and the reason is uh, as follows, let's consider two such wires, here they are, and let's say that the currents are in the same direction, just uh, uh, as a special case. So we have two wires, A and B, carrying currents I, A, and IB flowing in the same direction. Now let's start with wire A. Wire A has a current passing in it, so it will produce a magnetic field at all points around the wire. So, wire A produces a magnetic field everywhere, especially at the location where we have wire B. So that is the magnetic field produced by wire A at that point. And you can see, why is it downward? Put your thumb with the current, and at that point, it, it is something like this. Here are the two wires, okay? This is A and that is B. Here is the current flowing in A, so at that location, the magnetic field due to this one there will be downward as we see it in here. And that magnetic field produced by A, as we saw from the bios of that law, is equal to a mu zero, the current in A, divided by two pi, the distance between the two wires. So, there will be a magnetic force on wire B. Why? Because wire B will find itself in the magnetic field of wire A and in chapter 28 we saw that if you take a current carrying wire place it in a magnetic field there will be a magnetic force on it which is equal to I L cross B so wire B will find itself in the magnetic field of A so there will be a force acting on it and let's call that force if the A to be the force on a length L of wire B due to the magnetic field of wire A. That force, as we saw here, is equal to I L cross B, which I, the I flowing in B, and the current coming from A. So this is the force acting on B due to wire A. You can see that the uh, current L and the magnetic field are perpendicular to each other. So the angle between these two vectors is 90 degrees. It becomes a simple product. And the direction of the force, L cross B, will be to the left. So that is the direction of the force on B due to A. And its magnitude is here. There is IB. That is the length of B. And that's the magnetic field produced by A, which is equal to mu zero IA over two pi B. So multiply all of that, and that's the force acting on B due to wire A. The direction of the force, if B A, is as you can see, it is toward A. So it will try to attract this wire toward the other one. Now, you can reverse the situation and ask, what is the force on A due to B? and it you will find exactly the same result as we have in here, and the force on A will be pointing in this direction. 
So here is the conclusion. Parallel currents attract each other and anti-parallel currents repel each other. And the magnitude of the force on any one of them is given by this equation in here. That is illustrated in here. Here we have two wires. There they are. I hope you can see them. There are the two wires. We first pass the currents in the same direction. And what you can see is that they attract each other. If we pass the currents in opposite directions, you can see that they repel each other. Focus on this area here. Here is the repulsion because of opposite currents. And here is the attraction because of uh, currents flowing in the same direction. So here is the situation. And now let us summarize what we studied about the forces between parallel wires. So this is section three now. Twenty-nine, three, and here we are discussing forces between wires. Of course, we mean current carrying wires. <coughs> so we consider. Consider two parallel, infinitely long wires carrying currents I A and I B and separated, separated by distance B. Each wire exerts a force on a length L of the other wire and that force F is equal to mu zero I A I B multiplied by L divided by two pi B. This is the force exerted on each of the two wires. The force is attracted for parallel currents and the force is repulsive for opposite or anti-parallel, opposite currents. And this is about the forces between uh, current carrying wires. Let's take an example on this. And that is question 11. Again, the questions, not the problems, the questions are always from the old edition. So let's see what do we have here. The figure shows three arrangements of three long straight wires. Okay, we have three wires. They are coming like this, three parallel wires. And we are just looking at the cross sections. Here, the current is going into the page. Here, the current is coming out of the page. So the problem says, the figure shows three arrangements of three long straight wires carrying equal currents, equal currents either into or out of the page. Find the net force on the current directed out of the page. Find the net force acting on this current. The other two are into the page. What is the current, or what is the force on this current that is coming out of the page? Well, let us number them, okay? The current coming out of the page is number three. I will call it number three. So we always want to find the net force on 
number three. You can see throughout that the distance between one and three is always small d. The distance between two and three is always capital D in all of them. So let's write the forces and then we will find the net force. In all of them, so this is question 11 from the old edition. In all of them, F31, which is the force on 3 due to 1 according to this equation, is mu 0. And they all carry the same current, so I, I will be I squared L divided by 2 pi. The distance between 1 and 3 is a small d. And F32 is a mu 0 I squared L divided by 2 pi capital D. And since capital D is more than small d, you can see that F31 is greater than F32. Okay? <coughs> so with this now, let's look at situation one. What do we have here? What is the force of one on three? They are opposite currents, so they will repel each other. And therefore, this one will exert a repulsive force on three. Likewise, this and this are in opposite directions, so this will repel number three. And therefore, we have two repulsive forces on number three. Both of them are pointing to the left. So in number one, the net force is equal to F31 plus F32, and its direction is to the left. Let's now look at number two. Number two, we put number three in between them. So, one will repel number three to the right, and two will repel number three to the left. So we have two opposite forces, and the net force is the difference between them. Now, one, three is higher, so the net force will be in the right direction. And its magnitude is equal to the larger force, which is F31, minus the smaller one, which is F32, and its direction is, is to the right. Finally, we come to number three. In number three, what do we have? This one will repel it upward, this one will repel it to the left. <clears throat> so we have two forces like this, okay? The two forces acting with number three will be like this. And the net force is the sum of their squares under the square root. So in number three, the net force is equal to F31 squared plus F32 squared under the square root. And then you can, if you have the uh, values of these vectors, you can find what angle does it make uh, in the second quadrant. So this is about the first topic we have today, which is about the uh, magnetic force between parallel current carrying wires. Next, we move to the second topic we have today, which is uh, Ampere's law, a very important law in electromagnetism. Let's start with something we did in electricity. In electricity, the basic law to calculate the electric field is Coulomb's law, okay? If you have a certain charge distribution and you want to find the electric field it produces, at point P, the procedure is to divide the object into small elements of the charge dQ, find the electric field due to that element, and then integrate over the whole object to find the total electric field at point P. Now, in some situations, this is a reasonable integration. You can track it, you can do it, but in many situations, it ends, it ends up to be a very difficult integration. So Gauss's law came to our rescue. It was a very simple law, as we saw in chapter 23, 
and it is based on symmetry. If you have symmetry in the uh, problem, like when you have sheets, cylinders, and spheres, then you can replace the very difficult Coulomb law with the much easier Gauss law to calculate the electric field. And that's what we did in chapter 23 to find the electric fields produced by infinite sheets of charge, by infinite lines and cylinders, and by spheres. So this is the situation in electricity. Now let's come to magnetism. What do we have in magnetism? Like Coulomb's law in electricity, the fundamental law in magnetism is the Biot-Savart law. This is the only law we have so far to calculate the magnetic field produced by an electric current. And we have used the Biot-Savart law in the two simplest cases, which are an infinite straight wire and the center of a circular arc. What if we have a symmetric object, like a sheet carrying a current, or like a cylinder, not just a wire? Is there another law that we can use, simpler to use, based on symmetry, that we can use to calculate the magnetic field, just like Gauss's law in electricity? And the answer is yes, and that law is Ampere's law. So Ampere's law is the symmetric version of the Biot-Savart law. Here is the statement of Ampere's law. Let's go through the statement and then see how it works to find the magnetic field. Ampere's law says the line integral, line integral means you integrate over a path, over a loop, a closed path. So that's a line integral. The line integral of this quantity, the dot product of the magnetic field and the displacement uh, vector, around a closed path is equal to a mu zero multiplied by the current enclosed inside that path, where I think is the total net current passing through any surface bounded by the closed path. So here is the mathematical statement of Ampere's law. The closed line integral of B dot dS is equal to a mu zero I enclosed. Before we discuss this law, observe the extreme similarity between it and Gauss's law. There we have a closed integral, but in Gauss's law we integrate over a surface. Here we integrate over a curve, over a loop. There we talked about the enclosed charge. Here we talk about the enclosed current. And then instead of one over epsilon zero, now the constant is equal to a mu zero. Otherwise, mathematically, they look alike. So here is Ampere's law. And as we said, this law is useful for current configurations with a high degree of symmetry, just like Gauss's law in electricity. Now, how do we apply this law? How do we use it to find the magnetic field? Here is the procedure. We will go over the procedure, and then we will start to uh, use it to find the magnetic field of specific situations. The first step to apply Ampere's law is to choose a closed loop, a closed loop, a closed path, whatever it is. It could be a circle, a rectangle, a square, a triangle. It's a closed loop, and now we call it an Ampereian loop. Okay, so here is an example of an imperial loop that it can be in. Divide the loop into differential elements, ds, like the blue arrow in here. So this is a differential element, and it is tangent to the curve in the direction in which we integrate. The red arrow here represents the direction of integration. And then guess the direction of phi. What someone may say, if I guess the direction of B, why do I need Ampere's law? Well, that's the basic requirement you need to apply Ampere's law. You need to have some symmetry. And if you have the symmetry, you can guess the direction of uh, the magnetic field. And then Ampere's law will add to that to find the magnitude of the magnetic field. So guess the direction of the magnetic field based on symmetry. If you cannot guess it, then Ampere's law will be useless. And then evaluate B dot ds, that's what we need in here. And then, after you evaluate the dot product, evaluate the integral itself, where you integrate over 
all of the closed loop. That's the meaning of the closed integral in here. And that will do it for the left hand side of the equation. Now work on the right hand side. In the right hand side, we have a constant, which is a mu zero, and then I enclosed. How do we determine I enclosed? To determine I enclosed, you only take the currents enclosed inside the anterior loops. So this one is out, it will not contribute anything. We only take these currents that are inside, enclosed inside the anterior loops. And as you can see in there, the currents may have different directions. So how do we determine the sign of the current? Here is the sign of conven uh, the convention sign. If the current is in the same direction as the direction of integration, we take it to be positive. If it is opposite to the direction of integration, then we take it to be negative. Look at this one here. Where is the direction of integration? It is the red arrow. So we are going that way, okay? That's the arrow there. We are going that way. That's the integration. Now what about this current? This current is coming out of the page, which is the same as the direction of integration. We take it to be positive. This one is into the page, opposite to the direction of integration, so we take it to be a negative current. And the reason for that, here is again what we are saying, we are going this way, that's the direction of integration, so anything going up would be positive current, like I1, anything in the other direction, like I2, will be negative. And the reason for that is here, here we have a current, I, coming out of the page, the magnetic field it produces will be in that direction. So that's the magnetic field, okay? That's the magnetic field. Now, the imperial loop we chose is a circle. If you decide to integrate this way, okay, look at the arrow here, then dm or ds and b are in the same direction, so positive. If you decide to go this way, then dl or ds is opposite to the magnetic field, so we have the dot product giving us a negative sign there. With this now, let's state uh, Ampere's law. Here is what we will do. We will first start, uh, start state Ampere's law, then use it to find the magnetic field outside an infinitely long straight wire. And we know the answer to that from bias of our flow. And then we will take one step more, and that is to find the magnetic field inside, not outside, inside a thick wire. And we will use Ampere's law to do that. So let's write what we have here. Okay, now we are, uh, I think that is 26, 29.2. Huh? Let's that one. That section is 29.2. 29.3 is Ampere's law. So, Ampere's law says the, I will just put the mathematical statement, the line integral of B dot ds is equal to a mu zero i enclosed. And we have seen the steps to apply a base law. Now we come to our first application, which is to find the magnetic field outside a straight long wire. Okay, so here is the wire. The blue area is the wire, carrying current i coming out of the page and we want to find the magnetic field at the distance r from the wire. We know the answer to that. The answer we got it from bias of that law, a mu zero i over two pi r. So the answer is no, we got it from bias of that law. What we want to do now is to get the same answer from a Pierce law, to see the procedure, to practice it. And then we will take the other step, the extra step, and that is to go inside the wire and find the magnetic field. 
So here is our first application, and that is to find the magnetic field inside, uh, sorry, outside, outside a long wire. Of course, a straight long wire. Okay. So the first step is to choose an imperial loop. Logically, what shape will go, what curve, what path will go with a cylindrical symmetry, the wire is cylindrical symmetry, and the shape to go with it is a circuit. Okay, that's the logical uh, shape to go with the cylinder. So the imperial loop is a circuit, a circuit of radius r, that's the distance at which you want to find the field around around the wire. Now, symmetry says that the magnetic field and the displacement vector ds are parallel to each other. D is parallel to ds. Okay, you can see that there. DS, you have no choice in it. It's tangent to the curve. The curve is a circle, so DS is tangent to the circle. B comes from the symmetry using the right hand rule, and we have seen that the magnetic field lines associated with uh, a wire are circles around the wire. So this is the magnetic field at any point, it is tangent to the circle. So the two vectors are parallel to each other the dot product that we have here will become a simple product. What is more? Since it is a circle, the Aperian loop is a circle, then all points on the circle will have the same distance from the center, and therefore the magnitude of the magnetic field will be the same all over the loop, because it only depends on the distance. So, what we have here is that B is uniform. That means it has a constant value over the Ampere's law. With this now, let us come to uh, Ampere's law. Integral of B dot ds is equal to integral of B ds because they are parallel. B is constant, take it out of the integral. So B integral of ds. What is this here? This is the length of the loop, the length of the curve. Okay, that's, it's a line integral. We are not integrating over a surface, like Gauss's law. We are integrating over a curve. So this integral here is the length of the curve. In this case, the, length, the curve is a circle. What is the length of a circle? It's the circumference of the circle. So this is equal to B into two pi r. That's the left hand side. Now equate it to the right hand side. B into 2 pi r is equal to mu zero. And what current is enclosed inside the anterior loop? Well, here is the anterior loop. And in this case, the whole current is enclosed inside it. So it is a mu zero multiplied by the current passing in the wire, which is i. So the magnetic field is equal to mu zero i divided by 2 pi r, which is exactly the equation that we got in the last lecture using uh, Biosabat law with so many integrations, if you remember. But here we get it simply from the symmetry of the problem. Now let us proceed and find and ask what is the magnetic field now inside the wire, okay? So now we are moving inside the wire, somewhere in here. We want to find the magnetic field at a point inside the wire. So that's what we have here. Now we are at a point somewhere inside the wire. What is the magnetic field there? So that is our second application of Ampere's law, and that is to find the magnetic field <coughs> The magnetic field inside a long straight wire. 
Well, we repeat the procedure. We take an anterior loop. Again, the anterior loop is a circle, but now the circle is inside the wire, and it has a radius r, which is the distance at which we want to find the field. So, <coughs> the anterior loop is a circle of radius r. Let's carry out this integral, integral of b dot ds is b times ds, the same argument applies, ds and b are parallel to each other, b is constant over the circle, over the red circle, take it out, and the integral of ds is just the circumference of the circle, which is 2 pi r. So there is nothing different from what we have here. The difference now is I enclosed. In the first case, the whole current was enclosed inside the anterior loop. Now, part of the current, okay? We only want the current inside the anterior loop, which is the current here. But there is some current outside the anterior loop. So the question is how much current is enclosed inside the anterior loop? The answer to that comes from the current density. Remember the current density? J is equal to I times A. So I, uh, sorry, I over A. So I is equal to J times A. And the idea here is that the amount of current enclosed inside the anterior loop is equal to the ratio of the areas, the ratio of the cross-sectional area. The area of the anterior loop divided by the total area of the wire. So I enclosed is equal to the area of the anterior loop divided by the total area of the wire multiplied by the total current I in the wire. And when we talk about the area, of course, the cross-sectional area, the area that is perpendicular to the flow of the current. What is the area of the anterior loop? It is pi r squared, and the total area is pi capital R squared multiplied by i. So this is i small r squared divided by capital R squared. Now, let us put it all together. Substitute in Ampere's law. The left hand side is there, b into 2 pi r is equal to a mu zero into i enclosed, which is here, i r squared divided by r squared. So we cancel this r with the square in here, and you can see that the magnetic field at any point inside the wire is equal to a mu zero i over 2 pi r squared multiplied by r, where r is the distance from the center of the wire. And you can see that it is a linear relationship. It increases linearly as we go from the center to the surface of the wire. And as always, we ask about the match. What if I am on the surface of the wire? If I am on the surface, then small r is equal to capital R, and this would be mu zero i over two pi r, which is exactly what we have outside the wire. So we put it all together. Graphically, the magnetic field will look like this. Outside the wire, this is the distance r from the center, and this is the surface, okay, this is capital R, so this region is inside the wire, that is outside the wire. If you are outside the wire, it goes like 1 over R. If you are inside the wire, the magnetic field increases linearly from 0, it increases linearly, that is this relationship, until it reaches a maximum at the surface and then it will decrease like 1 over R. So this is the application uh, of Ampere's law to find the magnetic field inside and outside an infinitely long straight wire. Let's now take some examples on Ampere's law. And we start with this sample, pro uh, this problem, okay, this is a problem, 
problem 25 in the textbook. It says, each of the eight, we have eight carrots, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Each of the eight conductors in the figure carries five amperes of current. The current in each one of them is five amperes, but some of them have the current coming out of the page, some of them have it into the page. So five amperes of current into or out of the page. Two paths, these are the red curves in here. Two paths are indicated for the line integral, integral of B dot DS. What is the value of the integral for the path A at the left and the path on the right? Well, the value of this integral, according to Ampere's law, is a mu zero I enclosed. So all we all have to do is to find how much current is enclosed inside the loop. If we look at this one, you will find a net current of zero. Okay, plus five, minus five, minus five, plus five. So they cancel each other. We don't have to worry about this one. Let's focus on this one. This current is outside the loop, so we do not take it into consideration. And here, we have two out of the page and one into the page. Well, that will cancel this one, okay? So these will cancel. And we are left with only this one. Now, is this one in the direction of integration or opposite to it? The direction of integration, you can see the arrow. The direction of integration is that way. So any current going into the page will be positive. Out of the page will be negative. This is out of the page, so it is negative. And therefore, the integral of B dot ds will be equal to mu0 into i enclosed, and i enclosed is 5, but negative, so it will be minus 5. And therefore, this is minus 5 mu0, which is minus 5 times 4 pi, times 10 to the minus 7, and that's the value of this integral for uh, this loop. Let's now take some uh, problems on applications of Ampere's law to infinitely long wires. And we start with this uh, problem, and uh, this is from the old edition of the textbook. So let's see. Okay, problem 85 <coughs> says the figure shows a cross section of a hollow cylindrical conductor. So it's like a thick tube and you take a cross section and that's what you have. A hollow cylindrical conductor of inner radius B and outer radius A carrying a uniformly distributed current I. The current is here in the shaded region. Find expressions for the magnetic field B as a function of R, where R is the distance from the center as you go out. B as a function of R in the various regions of the wire. Well, how many regions do we have? We have this region, the empty region inside the tube, the wire itself within the wire, and then outside. We need to calculate the current density in this region in the tube itself because we will need it for our calculation. So let's start with calculating the current density here in the shaded region where we have the tube. The current density in that region, J, is equal to I over A, where A is the area of the tube, and that is equal to I over pi. These are circles. So it is the outer circle, A squared, 
minus the inner circle, which is p squared, and that is a squared minus b squared. That's the current density. Now let's go through the regions. First region, r less than b. Where are we? Here is b. r less than b means we are in this wide area, the, the empty area. What's the magnetic field? It is zero. Because in this area, there is no current at all. And according to Ampere's law, I enclose the zero, so the magnetic field is zero. So, in this region, I enclosed a zero, so the magnetic field is zero. Let's now come to the second region, B less than R less than A. Where is this? This is the shaded region. This is where we have the tube. Now, to do, to find the magnetic field here, we apply a this law. We take our Amperian loop to be a circle of radius r, which is the distance at which we want to find the field. Here is the Amperian loop. And then uh, apply Ampere's law, integral of b dot ds, like we saw in our derivations, is just b into 2 pi r. What is I enclosed? I enclosed is equal to, remember J is equal to current per unit area, so I is J multiplied by A. That's what we will use here. It's J of the wire multiplied by the area of the anterior loop, only the current enclosed inside the anterior loop. So this is equal to J is equal to that I over pi into a squared minus b squared multiplied by the area of the anterior loop and the area of the anterior loop is pi okay here is the anterior loop we only take this area not where we don't have current only where you have current so it is r squared minus b squared so that is r squared minus b squared. This will cancel that. Now put it all together. Integral of b dot ds is equal to mu zero i enclosed. So what do we have? This is b into 2 pi r is equal to a mu zero into all of this. A mu zero i into r squared minus b squared divided by a squared minus b squared. So, now dividing, you can bring this here. The magnetic field within the tube is equal to a mu zero i in, uh, divided by two pi a squared minus b squared. All of these are constants. And then comes the variables, r squared minus b squared divided by r, okay? There is the magnetic field within the tube. The last region is when we are here, outside, where small r is greater than a. Well, that's a very simple situation for r greater than a. You basically have a long straight wire carrying current I. You don't really care what is inside it. You are outside it, you only see the current in the wire. And the current in the wire is I, therefore, it is just the equation for the magnetic field outside an infinitely long straight wire, and that is a mu zero I over two pi multiplied by R. If you like, you can take an imperial loop outside and ask yourself what is inside that anterior loop. It is the total current in the wire, so that's what we have here. In the next problem, we will have the same configuration, except we will put another wire inside here. Okay, so that is the next one. In the previous problem, we only had this one. Now we add another wire inside, and that's problem 87 in the multiplication.
So let's see what do we have. <clears throat> Problem 87 says the figure shows a cross section of a long conducting coaxial cable, coaxial, uh, a wire inside a uh, tube, and gives its uh, radii, gives its radii A the outer one, D the inner one, and C the other wire. Equal but opposite currents I are uniformly distributed in the two conductors. So if this one has the current out of the page, this one has it into the page. They are equal currents but in opposite directions. Equal but opposite currents I are uniformly distributed in the two conductors. Derive expressions for the magnetic field as a function of distance r in the various regions. Now, how many regions do we have? We first have this region inside the inner conductor, and then the region between the two, and then within the outer conductor, and then outside the whole configuration. So let's take them one by one. If we start with the first region, where the distance r is less than this, this is inside the inner conductor. Well, this is a point inside the wire. That's what we derive here. That's this equation for the magnetic field inside a wire. So that's what we will use here. The magnetic field P is equal to a mu zero I over two pi, the radius is C squared, and then multiplied by R. B. Now let's take this white area between the two, where C is less than R, less than B. This is between the two conductors. What will contribute now? If I draw an imperial loop here, what is inside it? It's only the inner one. That one will not contribute. So here, only only the inner conductor contributes to the magnetic field. So it's simply the equation for the magnetic field outside an infinitely long wire. Very simple situation. B is a mu zero I over two pi R. C, if we are now within the second conductor here, B less than R less than A. Now here, both wires contribute. Okay, both of them will contribute. The inner one will give me a magnetic field, let's call it V1, that is mu zero, I over two pi R, because if you are here, you are outside that one. So it is simply that one. And for the outer conductor, we put the magnetic field here. Okay, that's the previous problem. B2 is equal to mu zero I over two pi A squared minus B squared into R squared minus B squared over R. And these are opposite magnetic fields because of opposite currents. So in this region, the net magnetic field is equal to V1 minus V2, which event is larger, okay? It will be the difference and the magnitude will be the absolute value of that. Finally, if R is greater than A, so we are outside, outside the whole configuration outside the two conductors. What is the magnetic field? Zero. Because you have two opposite currents. One is positive, the other is negative, the net current is zero, so the magnetic field is zero. Of course, 
this like the uh, equation for the magnetic field outside an infinitely long straight wire, but now you have two wires and opposite current, so they cancel each other and the net magnetic field is zero. And that brings us to the end of our class today, in which we discussed two main ideas. The first one is the uh, magnetic force between parallel current carrying wires, and the second is Ampere's law and its applications to find the magnetic fields of symmetric distributions.